Hello, Australia. Welcome to My Millennial Money. I'm Glenn James, and this is John Pigeon. And we are watching you down the barrel of the camera on YouTube. So, hello. Thank you for watching us or listening to us on YouTube. Yes. It's been a wild ride, hasn't it, John? Many cameras. Many cameras. Now, today we've got the pleasure and the privilege of being joined by Kate McCallum. G'day, Kate. How are you? Kate. I am super well. Thank you. Now, Kate, I've known Kate for some time now in financial planning circles and Kate is an advisor herself and she's just released a book with Julia Newbold. We're going to talk about all the cool stuff in the book because I've got a lot of good things to say about it, John. Have you? I have. Have you read it? I've flicked. Yeah. <laughs> I only got it a, like two days ago. Read. Yeah. yeah. I'm intrigued um, by writing books. So I might ask you later. Well, I had my um, little tag. Yes. So I've marked it in a couple of places. Cool. Now, thank you to Sun Super for supporting the podcast. And I wanted to say that Sun Super are advisor friendly. So a lot of you who listen have financial advisors that you work with in your life. And before we press record, I said to Kate, oh, do you use Sun Super? Like, I'm just gauging this because what if there was someone in here that was opposed to them? Kate, what have your experiences been with Sun Super in your advice practice? Well, it's interesting, as you know, like we can only ever recommend a super fund or any other investment product that suits each particular client. But I'm really pleased to say that Sun Super has been a really good option for clients of mine that have millions of mm. dollars, as well as clients who are starting out. So people who are in their 20s and just looking to get started with good investments, but low cost. And we're big believers in in low cost super, mm. because obviously the more money that you've got in your super account that gets to work and, and compound grow, yeah. over time. Kate um, could go on their ad, I reckon. Yeah. That sounded really good. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> You, you can you can give me an intro, John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, as an advisor, nothing horrendous to say about Sun Super, our show partner. No, very happy with Sun Super with the clients that we've recommended use it as their their super fund. Yeah, yeah. So. and my kids are in it too. So. Oh wow! <laughs> and it's funny that like when we were talking to Sun Super about being a show partner, I said to them, "I'm like, yeah, I love a show partner." I I think your product's good. Yeah. Uh, I'll use it myself and I do. But I would never, ever say everyone go out and blindly use Sun Super. Yeah. And I've told them that because it just doesn't fit everybody. Every product doesn't fit everybody. Yeah. No, we, we as advisors use a wide, wide range of superannuation and investment funds because as you say, it's it's horses for courses. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you to Sun Super for supporting the podcast. Mm-hmm. All right, Kate, I am so, like, I got this in the mail and there it is if you're watching. It is called The Joy of Money. Now, give us the the 411 or the 812 or whatever numbers that the cool <laughs> kids are saying about why did you do this with Julia? What's the purpose? Because I want to chat about this. Well, basically, it came out of a lunch that Julia and I had where I was complaining about you know, as advisors, we can we can obviously do a lot of work with clients about getting them engaged with money, but there's equally a huge number of people that we never get to meet. And many people walk away from conversations about money. You know, they go, oh, money, money, it's boring. You know, it's, it's not something I really want to spend my time thinking about or worrying about. And so our thinking was, what could we do to actually get people re-engaged with money? And we decided the old-fashioned book was a really, really good way to go, but with a bit of pizzazz Mm. and hence the idea of of bringing the joy back into the money. And you'll notice like through the book, it's it's designed as as either a read from cover to cover or you can actually flick through. Like it's designed to pick up and, and just investigate something that you're particularly interested in at the moment. But there's lots of stories in there. There's little tips. There's hacks for people who don't want to spend a lot of time. Mm. Um, and there's also um, just little things that we've done to make it a bit more fun, like have songs um, that relate to the different topics throughout. Yeah. So if you are interested in checking it out, and there are a lot of you who listen to the podcast who love reading and always want book recommendations. And I say like, 
I love reading money books and listening to money audiobooks myself because John and I, like, we're not above any of this and it's always just encouragement. But some of the chapters, values, goals and priorities, investing, taking charge of, uh, of your future, there's super, there's insurance, there's borrowing money, there's career, there's stuff about your home, relationships and money, money and kids, like everything. So, Kate, when you, like there's thousands of books out there on money and various uh, directions in which they focus on. When you first started thinking about writing a book, what was what did you want to be that point of difference in yours? The biggest thing that we found was a lot of the books that are written, yet yeah, they've got really, really good content, but they don't necessarily show people how to implement things easily. And so it's, you know, it's a little bit like diet stuff, yeah. you know, like we know, we know what it takes to have a healthy body. We've got to mm. exercise more and we've got to eat less. And yet, you know. You're a guest here, Kate. How dare you? T- <laughs> <laughs> well, eat the right foods anyway. Not, <laughs> we don't want to starve ourselves, but eat, eat is what you say, right? Uh, All the good stuff that the yeah. dietitians tell us. Yeah. And I won't <laughs> pretend to be an expert in any of that. Uh, but you think about it and. The way that, you know, we, we, we know the concepts and there's plenty of information yeah. on the concepts, but the, the stuff that works is when somebody gives you an on-ramp, they give you a framework, they give you something that helps you make it easy, that, yeah. you know, you can make it a habit. Take action. Yeah, take action. Yeah. And really that's what we were trying to do with The Joy of Money was provide something that didn't read like a normal money book. We've We've tried to get rid of jargon make the language very accessible, but also create lots and lots of stories and tips so that there are those on-ramps to putting good money practices in place yeah. so that, you know, you don't have to work quite so hard at it. Yeah. Did, did you, like being a financial advisor, money is quite a common topic. Uh, <laughs> do, do you also find that money is still not talked about in the in the family home growing up? Like, is it, is the word actually getting out there where it's more comfortable to talk about it as opposed to it being brushed under the carpet because we've got none of it or we've got too much or it's greed or it's selfish? I I can definitely see a shift with the 20-somethings um, compared with the 50-somethings, you know, where in a relationship they're much, much more prepared to talk about money and how they're going to manage money yeah. and setting up accounts. Like we had dinner on Sunday night with um, – our eldest son, his wife, and two of their friends, which was super fun. So these are late twenties, early thirties couples, and they were actually talking about yes, we you know we want to set up some accounts and we want to set up a an account so that we've got discretionary expenses to have fun and cool. um, so there's there's a lot more conversation and I think engagement than perhaps there was with with you know people who were that age thirty years ago. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's good. There's there's one page of the book that I've flagged and I just want to have a bit of a chat about it. And I think it was my favorite kind of part of the book because you don't hear these words much around money stuff. And it's chapter seven about your career, which is, you've called it your human capital. So, what's the premise about this in the book? So, here's my thinking. Most of the time when people talk about getting ahead, what do they talk about? They talk about cutting expenses, Mm. yeah? So there's so much focus on manage your cash flow and don't spend too much. And I'm not saying that's not important because Mm. we also talk a lot in the book about conscious cash flow and how to do that well. But if you think about it, how much can you really, really save? If you Let's say you could cut 10% or 20% from your expenses – you might realistically be able to save, let's just pick a number, save ten or 20000 Now, that's pretty good, but think about the upside if you've got a really, really amazing career, like just a stellar career. I'm not even saying that you actually have to have a huge income because you don't, mm. but what you've got to have is a sustainable employment um, capability. So you've got to have the skills, you've got to have the knowledge that you're always going to be employable. Yeah. So I'm a huge believer in get good skills, build your knowledge, stay up to date because that's the stuff over the long run that will enable you to always earn a good income. And as I said, there's far, far more upside in having good income and yeah. looking after that human capital yeah. 
than there is in cutting expenses, even though, as I said, that's yeah. important too. Do you think um, there's a word on the front of your book that also relates to that and, and the joy of what you do from nine to five? Like if you're enjoying it, should the money look after itself in a, in a lot of cases? Look, I'm a big believer in follow follow your passion, but but you've also got to be a little bit strategic about it. So to give you an example, I ended up in financial services um, 20 plus years ago yeah. because what I was looking for was a growth industry. And I looked at, at two industries at the time. One was telecommunications and one was financial services. And it just so happened that I just liked the offer that I got um, in financial services. So I took up a role. And I've built my career in financial services because it was a growth industry and because there were opportunities to move into a new role and do something new and different and yep. learn something new. But you're quite right. I think you can't you can't just chase the money. Yeah. You've got to do something that that you really enjoy. And you become more passionate about it the more that you get into it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. The money's cool though. The money's <laughs> look, the money gives you choices. Yeah. And and again, you know, this is important too, because if you if you choose something that you do enjoy and there's good money in it, you can choose to have a three-month break. Yeah. You can choose to stop that, reskill, do something else. You yeah. can choose to get involved with a startup. You know, you, you've got the ability to actually make different choices than somebody who's just stuck on the money-earning treadmill. Yeah, which has a, a, a ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to like kind of, I guess, throw it out there as a discussion point. We're doing an episode – and I don't know if it's going to be up before or after this one goes up, but it's about working smarter, not harder. And John and I, we've both got a list of 10 things that we think, you know, frame it up. And when I was preparing for that episode, I was thinking about this human capital and actually talking about transferring your human capital into growth assets. So, how, like we, we trade our time for money a lot of the times when we go to work but we need to exchange that human capital. So you go to work and then swap it into a growth asset. So your time at work has will never, ever be resulted in nothing. So I, I'm probably doing a really bad thing at explaining this, but if you worked for a day and you took $200 and bought a pair of jeans for $200, that transfer of human capital, because you've changed your time for a pair of jeans, that pair of jeans will wear out and be worth nothing, mm. it'll be consumed. But we need to have the mindset of that $200, if we invested that into either an extra super contribution, which is easy, anyone can do that, or into an investment property or shares, yeah. Yeah. that human capital has been preserved for the rest of your life and it will breed. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, I know where you're going with that. Mm. It's... um. It's combining the now with the future, isn't it? Is saying, well, I'm going to allocate a certain amount to those pair of jeans versus allocating a certain amount to future me and, and how that's going to grow and what that's going to look like. If we solely focus on now, we might not have too much of a, a wealthy future in terms of the bank balance. And I think just as a, like a, a mind hack thing, uh, Kate and I were talking before you got here, John, and maybe Kate can elaborate it on like when we're shopping and consuming it's that trade-off of i want it now and i'll grab it and maybe overpay versus i will pounce on something that i've been looking at and get the value do you want to talk to maybe some experiences you've had kate oh look this is one of my favorite topics and in the joy of money one of the key things that we talk about is starting with your journey when you're thinking about money is actually focusing on your values and what you value the most. And, and what we were talking about, Glenn, was this value for things that are aesthetically beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, um, and to your point, John, you know, not just everything being about the future, because if that's something that gives you joy now, well, you're hey. You're out of balance. Yeah, 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 you're out of balance. Totally. So this is this is very, very much about balancing current me with future me. Yeah. Um, so I I love beautiful things. And, um, and so... Um, so we're not on your hit list then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's just, it's about working out, um, you know, what it is that you really value. And then that's where 
you allocate your dollars to the stuff that you value most and just don't waste dollars on stuff that's not high value. But then in doing that, there's some some tactics. So the value piece is strategic, mm. but then the tactics are around waiting for a sale, waiting for a warehouse sale. And one of my favorites, which is in our frugal tips in the book, is what I call the 30-day rule. So this is this is the antidote to impulse buying. So let's say I'm I'm walking through um, the shopping centre, and I see a fantastic pair of boots, and I'm I'm an absolute shoe lover. I love good shoes, and they're impressive too. They thank are. you, thank you. Do you wear them, or do they wear you? <laughs> <laughs> a balance of both. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I see them and I go, oh, got to have them, I have to write them down, and in my case, it goes into my electronic notebook, and then in 30 days' time, if I still absolutely have to have them, then I go buy them. Yeah. Right. But you know what happens nine times out of ten? Don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so then when I do, when I have that one times out of ten, boy, oh, I'm in. you know, I'm in and I so love whatever it is that's actually made it through that 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 stage gate. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's in the book or not, Kate, but my wife buys something or pretends to buy something, puts it in the checkout and then waits 24 hours and there's often a special discount code uh, waiting for her by the time she goes back there. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. I, like I, I don't do much online shopping but that definitely happens, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, it sure does yeah. and it's it's well worth it. You will often find that you might get an, a 20%, 10% discount offer, free postage. Yeah. Um, like, sometimes I put things into the checkout and I just leave them because of my 30-day rule Yeah. Mm. and then by the time – it's ready to buy. They've yeah. actually been discounted again. Coincidentally. So double whammy. It's <laughs> it's excellent. There you go. Yeah. That's actually interesting. Might have to try that little scenario. <laughs> no, well, you, you don't need to try that. Well, it was funny because we bought an online course about video production and all that. And I thought, oh, I'll just try the first module for a hundred bucks or whatever it was. And then purchase that. And then it's like, all right, now if you buy the whole thing, it's like 40% off. Yeah. So I just grab the whole thing. So it's kind of putting your toe in the water. Yeah. Yeah. I had the same thing. I bought um, Japanese um, language courses and, oh, yeah. and I did the same thing. I waited for the discount on the first component. And then when I bought the first component, they offered the second and third for some tiny incremental amount. Yeah. So never pay retail. So I want to talk about housing. Uh, yourself and Julia, you've talked about housing myths. What's the myth that uh, you want to get across to people who might read your book? Well, I think one of the biggest things, and I know I, I found this pressure from my parents, was that buying a property was just absolutely essential for wealth building. You know, it was it was the one thing that you, you, you needed to do. My experience and the analysis that I've done actually demonstrates that buying a home is not necessarily better off than renting, particularly if you want to live in a hub you know, if you want to live in an inner city area where you've got all of your, you know, fabulous facilities, cafes, restaurants, bars, then the analysis actually shows that if you use the money that you would have used to purchase a property for other wealth building, so you put it into investments or super, that you could actually be better off um, by renting using that money wisely than if you purchase a place. And look, the, the biggest reason is that a lot of the data that we see, so the headline data in the papers where people are saying, oh, yes, you know, real estate's made all of this money. What it doesn't include is the transaction costs of getting in and out. So you've got mm. stamp duty, you've got agents fees. It doesn't include all of the renovations and the capital improvements that people often do to properties. Mm. So if you think about, you know, I'm, and I'm in this situation, I've bought a property, I do a renovation. So yes, the capital value goes up, but what that doesn't account for. Yeah, to pay for half of that capital value. Is, yeah, is yeah. the money that I've paid in. And then, of course, there's the running costs of property. So anybody who's had an investment property or owned a property knows you've got to pay maintenance to keep it up to speed. You've got to pay strata fee. You know, and, and your actual physical house or apartment is actually a depreciating asset. So, you know, to keep it fashionable, you've got to renovate the bathroom, you've got to renovate the kitchen. And so the analysis and my experience indicates that it's not a surefire way to build wealth. Not to say that you don't do it, but treat your home as a lifestyle asset, not as an investment asset. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that we just by default almost growing up, like I grew up at a suburb called Berkeley Vale. And it's like, oh, I want to buy an investment property. I instantly just go, oh, what's around my local street? 
for example. And I'm a, I'm a fan of property. I'm a fan of shares. I'm a fan of building wealth for the long term. But I think it is just that stepping back and looking at your wealth building strategy, but also how does that play in with your lifestyle goals? Because for me personally, I don't know if I could rent. I'm not sure just because I like that it's mine. But in the right and the wrong situation, that could be a costly mistake. And I got into the place I'm living now at the right time, so it kind of worked out. But otherwise, it could have been a very costly mistake or not even a mistake, but a, a lifestyle choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right, uh, Kate, about the the lifestyle of doing renovations to our own home and the cost of the interest while we're holding it and trying to pay it down, hopefully in less than 30 years. Um, like that's coming from a guy who's built wealth through property um, as a major tool, but was always rent vesting. So that rent vesting 20 years ago was not cool, right? It just wasn't done. Why would you do it? It's silly. And to, and probably still is in, in a lot of cases because the great Aussie dream is buy your own home. I think getting your own home and then saying, well, yeah, I want to add some, I want to expand the kitchen or I've seen this person's house and that looks great. I want to do the same thing is like going and buying five pairs of jeans um, for the now it's for the now it's for us it's for our emotions it's our lifestyle isn't it so versus um, planning for the future now if that property is adding value and creating wealth along the journey because it's in a blue chip region and it's going up in value consistently then it it pays you off uh, off off later that's the only point to add there isn't it yeah, and, and really that's cream on top and, yeah. and I'm not dismissing that in any way because it is, it's important. But again, if we go back to values and say, well, you know, is it important for your core values to have a place that you own as your home, Yeah. then absolutely go buy a place. That makes perfect sense. But if your core values are actually, no, I want to travel the world, I want to go work in London or New York or have an international experience, then buying a property in Sydney or Melbourne or wherever is, is not going to necessarily line up with those values or if there are other things that are important to you that you would prefer to spend money on. So it's more just, again, evaluating what's right for you and and just not yeah. falling into the trap of doing what everybody else is, is doing. Yeah, and I think it, it may have forced people's hands because of the prices anyway. It, it may have forced people to think, well, I go and buy some shares or I buy an investment property somewhere it doesn't cost me as much as living in Sydney or Melbourne now that's going to cost me on average $800,000. I just can't seem to find the deposit, but then my lifestyle is going to be impacted because of the repayments and I want to travel, all of those sort of things. So it's actually probably forced their hand to to not buy their own home in the short term or ever. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely fine. Look, the, the main thing that we say in the book is do the numbers. Mm. So actually sit down and crunch the numbers and there's some um, good calculations that we've included in there to help you actually work out what the costs might look like, but yeah, know cool. what you're doing. Mm. You know, don't go into it blindly. And just on that, like so many people, you know, they won't want to spend $300 on getting their accountant to do a spreadsheet of just like, hey, I want to buy an investment property. Can you just show me a spreadsheet of my um, income tax net output now? And then yeah. if I purchase the property do some assumptions for me. Like an accountant could whip that up in probably an hour or less. And if they charge $330, why do we think we're so gun shy about spending $300 on someone crunching the numbers if you can't do it yourself through, you know, books and whatnot, but, oh, I'll just go and walk in and blindly buy a house in the next street for 500 grand. That could not be the most appropriate thing. Yeah. I think it, also comes down to who's in our corner as well. Like I think we got something on the um, Facebook page the other day about um, this train of thought from the mortgage broker as to why you should do this but not do that. Mm. Like it it really, who we're influenced by is, is massive in this conversation, isn't it? it? It is absolutely. And look, I think, Glenn, to your point, sometimes people are a little gun shy to go to professionals, whether it's a financial advisor or a tax accountant or a lawyer, because they don't quite know what they're going to get. Yeah. 
I'm a huge believer in using experts in all sectors of my life because I know that it gives you this accelerated super boost. You know, there's totally. just and and it's not just the things that you don't know. Um, it's the things that could trip you up that could cost you. Yeah. So I would much rather spend a few hundred dollars or even a few thousand dollars to make sure that I haven't done something silly that's going to cost me a lot in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, again, half the reason why we're doing this podcast and the the conversation, just to have the conversation. And if you are wondering about, you know, if you want some information, just ask in the Facebook group and someone can jump in and say, oh, we actually did it this way. So it's almost like a crowd think, mm. which you don't want to get your your advice from the crowd, but it can at least give you thought points to just consider things like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Now, COVID aside, you know, we're in recession apparently, okay? How would you tell your clients, your friends, your own family to recession-proof their life and their money? COVID aside, because, you know, that one just blew everyone out. Interestingly, the answer to that is that there's some enduring things that you should be doing anyway. But, you know, the reality is that sometimes we don't quite get round to some of these things. And so this is about what can we do now to pretty quickly get ourselves in better shape so that a recession and we don't know how severe it's going to be, it's just highly likely that we're going to face one in the next few months. Um, what is it that you can do to just make sure you're in the best possible position? In the book, we talk about making sure that you've got a fund for the unexpected, you know, and you can call it your surprise fund. I'm, I'm, I'm big on using positive language around these things, but, you know, it's basically for, it's just giving you that cash buffer. And my guidance would be to have six months worth of expenses. So it's not income, it's expenses, because that's kind of the essential things that we want to cover for. And getting pretty quickly to building that. And so this is really about getting some savings happening as fast as you can so that you can get them into that, that surprise fund. Or it could be selling things that you don't you don't really need. You know, maybe you've got um, you know, excess furniture or you might have a spare car that you can, you know, you may not really need and you can actually release some capital and get it pretty quickly into a surprise fund. Mm. But that's number one. Get cash, get it quickly. The second one is conscious cash flow, which we've talked a little bit about, and there's a lot um, in the joy of money around this, but that's finding savings. And this is not spending on money, um, not spending money on stuff that you just don't really value. And look, you know, there's a lot of things that we can save on. You can negotiate with utilities providers. I've had a lot of clients going and negotiating with banks and getting a better interest rate. Um, silly things like my husband and I each separately had Spotify accounts. Hmm. And then I put them together. <laughs> Glenn had two at one stage. I had two Amazon yeah. Primes and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, you know, there's little things that we can do that actually save us money. Um, and so it's just being really mindful of where am I spending money that's not adding value and getting rid of that stuff, but keeping the spend on the things that do add value. So that's the conscious cash flow piece. Third, I hate credit. I hate credit cards. You know, I can't believe that we have an official cash rate of 0.25% and yet credit card rates can be up to 20%. Yeah. They are evil things. Do not rely on credit. There are so many alternative ways of accessing shorter-term borrowings yeah. than using credit cards. So I'm just not a fan. Human capital we've talked about. So keep reskilling. I think in times like this, it's really important to make sure you're employable and that you get that sustained employment because that saves you all sorts of problems if you've still got income coming in. Protection for your income and assets. And my number one on insurance is income protection. Now, it doesn't help you if you lose your job, but it does help you if you're ill or you're injured for a sustained yep, period of time. So I just think it does not matter whether you've got kids, you don't have kids, married, single, renting, purchasing, yeah, okay. income protection. So just on that, Nate, how old are you? Two two. So Nate's two two. Jeez, you've aged since you started working I here. Know. <laughs> he didn't have a beard when he started working here. Um so Nate's, you know, he's twenty two, lives um downstairs in his parents' house, like you pay board, rent. Yeah. So he's got expenses in his life. 
what would you say to the Nathans out there who have an income, who do not have financial commitments, quote unquote, like the mortgage or the children, about their income protection? If you have expenses, then you need income protection because otherwise the Nathans of the world are like my sons, that if something goes wrong and they can't work, guess where they're going to end up? They're going to end up on my doorstep. (laughs) So they're going to have an impact on my financial well-being. So ask your parents to buy your income protection (laughs) insurance. Or or stay at at home anyway. (laughs) But that's not such a silly idea. Mm. And it is one of the pieces of advice that I often give to my clients who have young adult children is don't go buy them a car, pay for their income protection. So you, you're saying your, your cash buffer, your three months or six months, shouldn't be used if you lose your job? If you lose your job because of unemployment, yep. your cash buffer is absolutely fabulous. Yep. So good. And obviously, the more that you've got as a cash buffer or assets, the less insurance you yeah. need. So you know it's a little bit like an excess on mm. a, a car insurance policy. Yeah. But income protection can give you that sustained payment because it can replace up to usually it's 75 to 80% yeah. of your earned income. Yep. And most policies are two years, but you can get them right up to age 65. So if you were really, really hard hit, and this is physical health and mental health. Yes. And, you know, some of the people that I know who've had longer term periods where they can't work, it's often because they've had an extended mental health issue that they're grappling with, income protection is an absolute lifesaver. Yeah, and do you think that second one, mental health is underrated but much more common than people think in relation to income protection? Yes, if we look at the data from the um, insurers, we can see that the mental health is a very, very big issue when it Mm. comes to claims on insurance. And, yeah, people do. They, they, They underestimate the likelihood of having mental health concerns um, and not being able to work consistently. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really important factor and we need to be mindful of it. So here's one for you. I'm Nathan. I'm 22. I need my car. Mum and dad say I need a reliable one that doesn't break down. I don't spend thousands fixing it. But I haven't got too much money in the bank. What, what am I doing in, in your mind? Am I getting a loan? Am I loan of mum and dad? Am I saving up the hard earned to pay cash for it? So here's my, here's my preferred approach. I like what I call the family bank. So instead of going and getting a personal loan and paying ridiculous amounts of interest, the proposal that I've suggested my children propose to me if they wish to have a car is that they apply for a loan with the family bank. I'm prepared to give them a rate of interest that's probably pretty similar to my mortgage rate, so I don't need to... Mm-hmm. you know, get a float on that. I'm, I'm happy just to have the same rate as what I pay for my mortgage. And we agree a time frame that that has to be repaid. And we agree regular repayments and it actually is documented and it's signed. And generally, it's a really good idea to have a solicitor prepare that loan statement. Yeah, There's a few advantages to that as well. Number one, it creates, I think, a very strong accountability with adult children around, totally. you know, not getting handouts. Secondly, it also means that if there's a relationship breakdown, that asset is not a relationship asset. That asset's my asset yeah. because I've loaned the funds. So I just recall my loan. So that money comes back to me and it's protected. I'll sue your ass, <laughs> basically. For the cost of the $5,000 yeah. car. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if the bank of mum and dad's not good uh, and mum and dad are still sorting their own funds out, Where's your next best option? Because it's a common topic, this one, isn't it? Mm, Yeah. Buy a bike, use Uber, use taxis, use variable expenses. Not, you you don't, if if you're short on cash, what you don't want to do is have a fixed expense of a car, which also then has increased variable expenses. Yeah. You know, it's going down in value. It's going down in value. So Mm. you've got an asset that's depreciating, it's costing you in insurance, petrol, and We've done analysis on this where we've looked at how many taxi or Uber rides you could rack up before you match the yeah. cost of running the car. And I can tell you, it's about one a week. It's yeah. actually, it's it's pretty good. It's just that price for convenience, That's isn't all, it? Yeah. But I, I would say if you are a younger person, you know, under 25 and you are looking at 
you know, buying your first car and if mum and dad can't help and you've got limited savings, I would just implore you not to get a personal loan or a car loan. Yeah. Um, no, just beg, borrow, steal. That's weird to say borrow, but you know what I mean? You know, the analogy. Yeah. Um, get a $2,000 piece of crap, save up another $700, $800, Sell the three thousand, sell the two thousand dollar piece of crap, because once cars get to the same type of price point, that and just slowly ratchet up your car. That's what I would say for what it's worth. Just because you want to keep your cash flow agile without being tied down. Yeah, and and back to the rent vesting um, positive. You can go and rent near a train station, can't you? You can and, uh, jump on the train. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Speaking of trains, this is actually. Good segue, because I wrote this down when we were talking on the phone the other day, Kate, and it just came up in conversation. Talk to us about layering and how you get efficiencies in your life with layering. Talk to us. So, layering for me is about how do I squish as many of the things that are important to me, so my goals, into anything that I do? Because at the end of the day, we've only got two resources. We've got time and we've got our money. And so you've got to, I think you've got to be really, really conscious and thoughtful about how you use those. So I was sharing with Glenn that um, when I travel to our office in Sydney, I, I usually stay um, not too far away from the office and I walk into work. So it's about an hour's walk. Wow. In my mind, it was not, like a 15 yeah, minute. Oh, not too close. That seems far, far away. <laughs> Who walks? Wow. <laughs> so, crazy me, I walk, I listen to podcasts while I walk, yeah. and that's a choice. So, I can either listen to a podcast that might be on money stuff, yes. economics, or just music, and it's still valuable because I love love music. So I listen to a podcast and so it actually gives me three things. It gives me exercise, it gives me transport because I don't need to hop on a train or a yeah. bus and I get some learning packed mm. in all mm. at the same time. So so this concept of layering is always thinking about how can I get more value. So I, I love the people who say don't buy the daily latte. For me, uh, coffee is, is again, one of the essential ways to start the day. Did you like the coffee that I made you? I did like the coffee that you made me. Thank you. It was a very, very nice drip filter long black. you like black. it without milk? I do like it without yeah. milk. Yeah. I just, I, I go for the coffee flavor. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to go buy your coffee, and I'm a fan of buying coffee each day, so I don't, I don't actually believe that that, for me, is a good expense to drop because I value it. Factor mm. it in. But let me say, how do I layer that up? Well, one way I layer it up is um, my two sons work in the city and so I'll organise to catch up with them. So we go and have a coffee together and there's a fabulous cafe not far from us that's run by a, a lovely Italian family and we can sit in the sun. So for me, that's again, it's three layers. I get fabulous coffee, Vitamins. get my vitamin D. Yep. Yep. D, yep. yep. Sitting in the sun, and I get to catch up with my my two twenty something sons, um, in an environment that is relaxed, relaxed yeah. and easy, and we just have a chat. And so, you know, I get three things. Yeah. So I just love this concept of always thinking about how do you just get the most value out of time and money. Yeah. Yeah, I I like the like because I I love coffee as we know. Like, there's the Glee coffee at up at Erina Heights, like it's probably a 12-minute drive from here-ish, okay? But I'll go down there for breakfast and I can listen to a podcast because I want to listen to something or if I've got to make a phone call that's going to be 15 minutes, I'm not just sitting at home doing nothing, like I almost will drive somewhere, then I kind of get to the destination. I don't know, it's just how can you... And it's probably, I'll write this down for the, I'm going to, I've stolen your layering thing for our episode about working smarter, not harder, um, because I think it all speaks to that. We've got so much human capital that can be deployed. How can we maximize the time and the capital and get the benefit from it? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great concept. I, I love the wording of it. I'm always wary that whilst we're layer, layering, we're not 
uh, losing our efficiency because we're layering with two things at once that complicate the the efficiency of it as well. That like in your examples, they are, they're perfect layerings, aren't they? Um, whereas people can often in a busy life try to layer with inefficiencies. And and I'm not a fan of multi skilling. I don't I don't think anybody can do yeah. well, that. Well, there was a Harvard study that I email out um, on my email list that. I think they basically said multitasking is a myth. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, look, I think the the flip side to this too is this is not all about being on and a hundred and no. always doing work related stuff a hundred percent of the time because it's not. You know, so I'm also a big believer in um, having that restorative time. And so I, you know, there's a lot of practices in my life where. I just carve out time to restore and re-energize. Yeah, just read a book or just yeah. yeah. It's for me, it's yoga. I, I yeah. try and do yoga every day um, and have a meditation as part of that, and that's for me is is a big restoration. Yeah, nice. Family's really important to me, and my relationships really important to me. So having time for that, um, and obviously, you know, doing things in the broader community around improving. Um, people's well-being, particularly financial well-being. So I'm involved with a number of not-for-profit organisations around that. So cool. Yeah. I want yeah, to finish with right. two questions, and the first one's a leading question. Kate, I'm disappointed about your book. There wasn't a chapter about generosity, but talk to us about the missing chapters. The missing chapters. Well. And John, you mentioned earlier you were interested in the process of, of writing a book. Yes. So Julia Newbold, my co-author, and I had um, worked out our framework for the book. We'd um, written virtually all of our, our text and then we approached publishers. So we were a little unusual because a lot of people approach publishers with a couple of sample chapters, whereas we had basically a Wrote it all. A, a fully written book. A whole truck. Um, and I think I'm probably also a little unusual in that I turned up with an Excel spreadsheet with my my count of the words for each chapter and the total oh, right. word count. The biggest challenge is with a book, there's a certain number of pages that you get to allocate. So it's a it's a little bit like a budget for a book and yeah. we had to make some pretty tough trade-offs about what went in and what has been kept aside potentially for some, some future cool. books. And unfortunately, the chapter on giving was one that with the context of what we were trying to um, write about and get across, we felt that that was probably the – the least meaningful chapter for for the purpose of this book. It's still got a purpose, sure. just it didn't quite fit here. But we are fans of giving. And again, um, you know, Glenn and I were talking about human capital. And one of the things that some of my clients have said to me is, you know, I really do want to give back. I want to work for a not-for-profit. And the conversation that we were having the other day is sometimes that's the right answer, but sometimes maybe you're just better off going with the for-profit organization, earning the extra dollars and then choosing where you're actually going to donate those dollars. And obviously mm. from a tax perspective, there's some some benefit Benefits. in getting a tax deduction. Mm. So again, yeah. it's about being smart about how you actually help and give. Yeah. Okay. So quick side note, how long did it take you to write those chapters out? <laughs> Um, there's a fabulous answer which I've borrowed from Tyler Cohen, which is um, it took 53 years, which is how old I am. <laughs> um, because obviously, you know, a lot of the things that Julia and I have written have come from all our many, many years of experience. Yes. Um, having said that, little tongue in cheek, we started the book with a broad concept of what we wanted to write and had a bit of an idea of what the outline would be. We then went and researched. So we did research interviews with about 100 people, uh, women and men, yeah. and that probably took most of the time. Once we'd done the research, it became pretty clear what the content needed to be. Yeah. Um, and so the entire project was a two-year project, but most of the writing happened in probably about six months. Yeah, wow. Well. Mm. Be sassy. Chapter two. Do you remember what sassy stands for? I remember what Sassy is all about. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so Sassy is fundamentally a structure for being really smart about wealth. And so what Sassy is about is making sure that you have structures in place 
So, you know, it's it's things like, and this is particularly for people who are not into money and think that it's pretty boring, but it's about making sure that you've got all of your accounts set up so that things are automated. And one of my favorite tips is to pay yourself first. You know, a lot of people spend and then they save what's left over. If you flip it and you treat your saving the same way that you treat mortgage payments or rental payments and you have a target amount, just an easier way to do it. And then you just, you can spend what's left. You may not even need to do a budget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's one of my favorites. So automating those sorts of things can make a huge difference. Um, spending is in SASE, so making sure that you've got your conscious cash flow happening, which we've talked a lot about. The A in SASE is for assets and liabilities. So that's doing an audit of what you own, your assets, and what you owe, which is your loans, and being really clear on what you've actually what your current position is. Um, we talk a lot about making sure that you um, review things and and there's some authors who've said, you know, you need to have a weekly review. I tend to have about a monthly review with my partner, but we have a big annual review. And interestingly, yeah. um, we've just done it. And I've, I've got the scribbly version in my book <laughs> um, of the whole goal setting framework, which we map out in The Joy of Money about how to actually go about doing a 10-year goal setting framework. And it's it's huge fun. Cool. Yeah, lots of robust discussions yeah, in that absolutely. as well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you got to be sassy. Spending, assets and liabilities, structure, set rules and define triggers and yearly and uh, perhaps weekly check-ins. Kate, thank you so much for uh, coming and having a chat. Now, Julie Bishop forwards the book. So, she's she is an impressive individual, isn't she? Julie Bishop um, blew our minds. She was the keynote speaker at a conference that Glenn and I attended last year last year and i was fortunate enough to have a meeting with her with another group of advisors and she had allocated half an hour for us officially it extended very very easily into an hour and she was so generous with her insights and her um just helping us think about how we could help people in our community be yeah. better off financially right. and she was just very very honest about her own position and i think it's you know it's a good lesson for all of us that we look at these people in the public light and you know she was the former deputy of the liberal party mm. um and foreign minister we look at them and we think they've got it all sorted but she confesses in the book that she really didn't have a financial advisor until she left politics yeah. Um, and she's very glad she's got one now. But she said, you know, I didn't have it sorted. And it's just a reminder that if we want to be financially well off, if we want to feel free and have these choices financially, um, that making sure that we do do some of these things, whether it's, you know, using the SASE framework or getting an advisor to help you, um, can make such a huge difference. But she was very generous um, in providing a forward for the book and we're yeah, We're very awesome. thankful to her for it. Yeah. Do you want to hang around for Community Member of the Week? Oh, I'm happy to hang around for Community <laughs> right. Member of the Week. Let's hear it. All righty We've got Flynn, who is 23 from Hobart. This is your week, Flynn. Thanks for being part of the M3 community. What does Flynn do, John? He is a supermarket department manager. And yeah. he is saving for their first house. Yeah. This is cool. How he's achieving that goal, saving about 60% of his income. That's solid enough. Totally. And the silliest money mistake, got a car loan while I had the cash in the bank because everyone told me I needed a credit score for a home loan. Wow, E. Jeez. It's just wild, isn't it? It's an expensive way to get a credit score. It is. Yeah. 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 So anyways, learned from that. So thank you, Flynn, for being part of the M3 community. Well and done, for those... Flynn. Wondering about the credit scores thing, like we can't say this enough that they don't mean that much in Australia because there's three major bureaus, that's the word, and when the banks and lenders want you to check your credit score, they'll pull data from each bureau. Each bureau has their own algorithm to make up the score and the banks will have their own algorithms anyway. Yeah. So I think the best thing you can do for your credit score, pay your bills on time, have cash in the bank and get on with your life. Yeah. Not and, a game changer. And as we said before, it's about getting the data. Like mm. don't don't listen to the hearsay. Find out what is it I need yeah. data-wise to demonstrate a good credit score and then 
do what the data tells you, what the checks are actually about, not what you've heard on the grapevine. Mm. I'm going to finish with this, Kate. If there was one thing, so we like to do this podcast for the one, so the one listener. So I'm going to make up a mythical person. Yeah, And it's funny, you know how I said that time, this podcast, it's for the person on the bus yeah. commuting out of Adelaide. That was or, him. Or he, he emailed me, he goes, oh, that's me on the bus. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so thanks so for listening. one's on a tractor so, somewhere. No, no, I'm, I'm making up. You're a 24-year-old female and you're driving in your car home from work in Brisbane. What have you got for this person, Kate? What two bits of advice about anything that you can think of? And she better not have a loan on that car. She better not have a loan on the car. <laughs> so, particularly because we're talking about a young female and what our research has told us is that women are more likely to step away from money, particularly as life gets more complex. You know, they might marry and have children or, you know, take on other responsibilities, end up dealing with other family members. So my one piece of advice is step into your money. Keep your hands on the handlebars. Yes. Some people say, oh, yeah, but it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. But we all know that the stuff that makes us feel a little uncomfortable, if we're really into it, it's the stuff that also has the greatest potential yeah. to help us grow. Yeah. You know, whether it's learning something new or it's money. So my advice for 24-year-old Brisbane woman is keep your hands on the steering wheel, yes. given that you're driving. <laughs> Keep Metaphorically <laughs> and actually and in the handlebars. Yeah. Yeah. So Keep, double dink if you've got a partner. That's it. Yeah. So layer up. <laughs> so you've got your hands on the money steering wheel and, and, and all the stuff we've talked about, make sure that you do the fact checks, you know, just like Twitter's doing fact checkers on mm. certain mm. politicians at the moment. But they check should your, delete that guy's account. Check your facts. <laughs> check your facts. Make sure that you're making decisions that line up with what's important to you because you're the ones with the hands on the steering wheel. Yes. So engage, get involved and uh, Inspirational keep driving. Finish. Thanks, Kate. Now, if you are a 24-year-old female in Brisbane, the first one to reach out via our Instagram, Facebook page, Messenger or whatever to say, I'm 24 in Brisbane, I'm going to send you a copy of Kate's book. I'll get Kate to sign it. Now, you've got a book over there as well. Can I keep one myself? <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> and what about me, Kate? Well, uh, uh, yeah, well, you get some, I get um, the e version or? Yeah, uh, we'll send you a link. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll send you the next one. It's on. So, uh, yeah, we, we'll <laughs> send you a Jeez. book. First 24 year old female in Brisbane. Come at me. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, uh, Kate. The Joy of Money. We'll put a link in the show notes and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. That okay. was huge fun. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.